So, we're come to the sermon now, and I'm going to ask Jonathan to come and preach and bring the Word of God to us. And this sermon title, and I won't, I'll just put it up on the screen. It's uh, not be controversial, but we'll see <laughs> what we mean by that when Jonathan comes to speak to us. Yeah, so <laughs> it is a little controversial, a little weird, but when we go into the sermon, actually, we're probably going to go even a bit further than that. Um, so before we start, we've got obviously an important part of the service is the art that's going to get drawn. So for kids or adults, um, I've just got two images in mind, but obviously more often than not, the kids think of even better ones. So the two that I had, and these are slight spoilers, everyone in the church, including the adults, if not especially the adults, draw as kids with Jesus as our parent, that's one. Um, or the second one, which is more relevant to the story we're going to be covering, a rich guy walking away from Jesus, crying but holding his money, and a rich guy smiling, coming to Jesus, giving his money to Jesus. And those are actually two characters in the Bible. So that's two ideas, but if you've got better ones, which you might do, I'd love to see them. So, first line, the commands of Jesus are impossible unless you're a kid. Today we're looking at the story of someone who wanted God, loved God, and he got the chance to follow Jesus, got the chance to show off that trust but he didn't do either of them. And it's because following Jesus is impossible unless you're a kid. In fact, last week we touched on the beginning of Matthew 18, and there Jesus says something even, even stranger. You can only enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become like a kid. You can only be saved if you're like a kid. Was he being serious when he said that? Did he mean to say that, or was he just making a point? Because, right before this tragedy, this heart-wrenching story, really, of a man who's desperate to get saved, there is a short section about those who do get saved. And it's just a, one or two verses about some kids who want to hang out with Jesus. The disciples stop them, but Jesus says no. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those kids Really, in one verse, these kids get eternal life. So this ruler, rich young ruler, had about 15 verses and he got nothing. These kids in one verse got everything. That's how serious Jesus was. So, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. amen. So, this is the last sermon in this series about what the kingdom of heaven is, and especially what, do it, what does its citizens look like. And these past few sermons we've been looking at money and how easily it pits us against the kingdom of heaven, Jesus and his kingdom. And this story of the rich ruler is also pitting God against money, Jesus versus stuff. And we'll see, hopefully, what kind of person it takes to get to follow Jesus so first we're going to look at this story, the rich young ruler. It's really the story of how not to get eternal life. But I heard a sermon on this man describing him as someone any parent would have been proud to have raised. He's an upright man, hardworking, intelligent, and even a fervent seeker of God. And yet he doesn't get saved. But before we start bashing him, just for a little bit, we'll big him up for a second. In Mark, he is running up to Jesus and basically knelt that collapsed in front of Jesus in public and in the day. So he's brave and he desperately wants to get to Jesus. And I'm not sure if, I, if I'm that brave. That's something that is really, really important that he did. Oh yeah, and that's another thing. 
he, if he is a ruler under this Roman Empire, it might even have been some kind of punishment for what he was doing if it was that public. So, he is urgently seeking eternal life, which seems like an admirable goal. So far, he wants something good and isn't afraid to come to Jesus. Seems okay. There is a buck coming. His first question to Jesus seems polite and right. In Luke's account, the rich man says this, Good teacher, ha! And apparently, he's already messed up. Jesus then responds, begins by responding with, Why do you call me good? Don't you know only God is good? Because normally people refer to Jesus as Lord. When people call him Lord, they're calling him God. That was God's name often used in the Old Testament. They recognise who Jesus really was. Why didn't the rich ruler call Jesus Lord or some other name, some other name of Jesus from the Bible? It's because the man doesn't get who Jesus is. He hasn't listened to Jesus because if he had, the story would have gone, Lord, let me follow you. You can give me eternal life. Jesus goes, yep, and end of story. The second thing that Jesus notices about this rich ruler is his approach to getting eternal life. When Jesus says, keep the commandments, he says, which ones? This rich man knows how to negotiate. <laughs> if I can whittle down the laws, or he's like, lose the Sabbath, but keep the murder one. That one's easy to keep. <laughs> and when Jesus tells him which commandments, he says, I have kept these since I was a boy. We know that's just impossible, especially if we take into account Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he's like, just thinking murder, thinking hate, and you've broken that law. Thinking lust, and you've broken that law. And, yeah, just thinking those means, really, if you broke one, you broke the entire law. So you've met, it's not really, <laughs> which ones can I keep? It's, have you kept them all? And the other thing is, really, remember that the sacrifices in the law were there for when we messed up. In one way, saying you didn't keep the law, or sorry, you always kept the law, um, isn't actually what the law's saying. It knows we're going to mess up. So it gives these sacrifices for when you've messed up, give this sacrifice. And really, that's a great picture of what Jesus does. But back to the ruler. Jesus knows, in particular, there are two things this rich ruler has broken about the law. And if we look at what he says he's got to do to fix this, we can see what those two things are. Firstly, give away everything he has. And secondly, follow Jesus. And these, interestingly, look quite similar to the two greatest commandments Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And love your neighbour as much as you love yourself. But he didn't do either. So in other words... <laughs> He actually broke the two most important commandments. So why did he break them? How could he have been so far from the mark? Because he looked great a minute ago. The problem this man had was he thought eternal life was something he could own. He wanted it as something on top of all his stuff. He thought it was a possession, not a person. Jesus can die and raise himself up because... He is the source of life. Eternal life, always having life, is just being near that source of life. When Jesus said, follow me, that was the way to get eternal life. Let's again look back at the few verses before this rich man. Those little children came to Jesus with nothing and wanting nothing out of him. And they did follow Jesus for them, it was easier because there was nothing holding them back apart from the disciples. <laughs> the end result of the story is a rich young ruler didn't get saved even with about 15 verses and everything in the world. Whereas a bunch of kids with one verse and no questions got to own the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible to follow Jesus unless you're like a kid. Now, at the end of this story, the rich young ruler's story, is the phrase, the last will be first. 
Jesus says it again at the end of the next parable. So I'll give a summary of this, par- this next parable, because it, it's a long one, a bit of a complex one. A landowner goes out in the morning to find workers. He finds them doing nothing and hires them, promising them a reward, in this case, a single coin. Over the course of the day, other workers are hired until some get hired right before the day ends. Everybody who worked for that landowner received the same reward, a single coin, regardless of when they were hired. Jesus ends it by saying, the last will be first. So we know these two sections are connected because of what he says at the end. But if we come at this from a a, a stuff perspective or a wealth perspective, it seems quite unfair. People who worked harder got the same amount as people who didn't work as hard. And in fact, if some people got hired near the end of the day, they may have done nothing. But... Maybe if I change this scenario, we can see it as maybe Jesus sees it. There's a birthday party for a kid going on in a town which starts in the morning. At first, most of the friends haven't arrived, but more come along over the day. The friends at the beginning of the day spent more time with the birthday kid than friends near the end of the day. But at the end of the party, all the attendees got a present or a goodie bag. Each gift had the same stuff in it. There is a shift in focus. This story seems less unfair. In fact, in my experience, I didn't really care if I got more or less at the, at the time. Afterwards, maybe I'd be like, there's only a Mars bar in it or whatever. But at the time, at the party, I didn't really care because I wasn't there for the stuff. As a kid, you would go to a birthday party to be there for your friend. And from that angle, is that someone? Oh, it's outside. Um, And from that angle, it's actually better the more friends that are there, the more the merrier. So what's the difference? The difference between those those two scenarios um, is what's the metric? What are we measuring? If it's stuff, or is it people? If it's stuff, that first story is really quite unfair. If it's people, it seems a great story. Loads of people get in. From a Christian perspective, who cares if some people got varying levels of stuff as long as we get more people following Jesus? The more, the merrier. In Jesus' life, he called poor fishermen and rich tax collectors. But the only one who complained about that was Judas. To all the other disciples, the more, the merrier. That's what it's like to work in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what that parable is about. Working in the kingdom of heaven gives us all the same one reward, Jesus. doesn't matter if we work loads or little, it's the same reward. King David had received the same reward that Dismas, the thief on the cross, received. Jesus. They both got to follow Jesus. David had a lifetime and a kingdom dedicated to Jesus. Dismas was naked and only had a minute. But he spent it confessing, repenting and praising Jesus. They both got Jesus. Do we see now why it might be easier for little kids? Babies don't care about designer shoes or high quality bibs. They want their mother. And toddlers don't really rate the manufacturing quality of their toys. They love them because their parent gave it to them. In fact, sometimes they love what we would say is a worse toy. But for them, it's great because their parents gave it. (laughs) That's right, yeah. (laughs) For little children, the metric is people. But as they grow older, that fades and they start to care about stuff. It's impossible to obey Jesus' commandments unless you're like a kid. So again, be like children. The children in Matthew 19 weren't coming to Jesus to receive financial security, fame, respect, food, or miracles. In fact, those children didn't even ask for eternal life, but Jesus said they got it. What was the difference between those kids and the rich young ruler? The little children just wanted Jesus. They just wanted him. They got eternal life because Jesus is eternal life. The rich young ruler came not wanting Jesus, but something Jesus could give him. 
The twelve disciples eventually gave up all their lives and everything they owned for Jesus. And to them, everything they owned to, be, to get Jesus was a bargain. They were happy to do it. But that's the strange thing is, not only did they give everything up, but we see that they're thankful. They're praising God while they give up everything, including their lives. And I think the key to that gratitude and generosity is to realise how much help we needed. To realise we came from nothing and leave with nothing, as Job found out. To think like everything we have belongs to Jesus. However, the rich young ruler was not thankful or generous. And in the end, he didn't give anything up to get Jesus. One of the first things that sermons on this story cover is, they're very quick to go, this punishment to the rich young ruler doesn't apply to all of us. <laughs> they seem to jump to, don't worry, we get to keep our stuff. It's just this poor guy who didn't get to. But I'm going to say, what happened to the rich ruler wasn't unfair. He wasn't being asked to do something impossible or even something special. First, I'll just quickly look at other rich men in the Bible and how they handled their money. Matthew was a rich tax collector. He gave up his job on the spot. Jesus just said, follow me, and he did. And he allowed his home, which seems to be a big home because it seems to <laughs> impact a town, he allowed his home to be filled with criminals, the poor, the sick, and even Pharisees. And Zacchaeus gave away half of everything he had on the spot, right in front of Jesus. And even that's interesting if we look at Zacchaeus, just for a minute. We've got the Pharisees who gave a tenth of everything they have, but they hate Jesus, so they aren't in the kingdom of heaven. We have Zacchaeus who gave 50%. And Jesus said salvation had come to Zach's house. And the rich ruler, who wasn't saved, but was asked to give 100% away. I don't think the moral of those stories is 50% is the sweet spot. <laughs> Just enough to get saved. I think Zacchaeus would have given more if Jesus had asked him. To end that, let's look at an example from Hebrews 11:26. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. Losing the money isn't what gets you saved. It's realising it isn't yours, but, Je but Jesus' belongs to Jesus. I believe this commandment actually applies to all of us. We all have to lose our stuff. We have to be like little children, where all our stuff actually belongs to our mm. parent. Little children generally don't get bank accounts, and if they do... The money in there wasn't earned anyway. For little children, everything they have is given to them and could be taken away. That's how we have to view money. It isn't really ours to begin with. In that way, we have to lose everything. We must act like our stuff could go away. This rich ruler needed this lesson to an extreme amount because of how much he loved stuff. However, if you're like me, then perhaps you might be saying to yourself, if Jesus really asked me, I would give it all away. But, do you see the problem with that? I still think the stuff's mine. In a small way, I'm really hoping Jesus doesn't ask me to do that. Really, we shouldn't see this as a punishment or as some trick commandment. As I was reading this, I wanted to stop and really imagine Jesus was asking me to give away everything. Would I be able to? I hope I would. But I think the way to figure that out is, what one item in my life wouldn't I give away? If someone in the church needed it, what one item would I not give away? 
And I thought, I thought, would it be my computer or my phone, my wallet or my room if someone needed it? Or more generally, what about my time or my energy? If it had been a long day, but someone in the church needed, say, furniture moved or someone to talk to, would I do it? We might do it once and feel good about it, but what if that happened every day of the week? What's our limit? Where would we draw the line? When it came to forgiving each other, Jesus seems to push that limit. Don't just forgive seven times. So in other words, don't forgive like for a week. You know, I could do a week. He's like, no, seven times 70. In other words, there is no limit. It might be Jesus asks us to work for others, love for others, or sacrifice for others beyond what we feel is possible. But remember, the disciples gave away everything, but Jesus did help them along the way. He didn't leave them. It is tough, but we aren't alone or helpless. So, finally, this sermon is the last in this series about pitting the kingdom of heaven against the kingdom of earth. God against money or the love of money. I don't have Jesus' insight I can't tell you what might be causing you to pause before following Jesus. But I think the reason Jesus is so extreme in his parables or requests is because of how dangerous and how tough it is to conquer our daily lives. In some ways, I think I'd actually prefer losing an arm or a leg if it meant I was secured forever. In some ways, this daily battle of Who will I serve today? Is my life today going to revolve around stuff or Jesus? Am I prepared to lose what I wanted today for what Jesus wanted today? Those daily battles, to me, seem tougher. But together, Jesus and his church, we can do anything. So even tomorrow, let's think of something that we get to give up to follow Jesus. Because in church, it's possible for us to be like little children. And it is impossible to follow Jesus unless we're like kids. Amen.